set on free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. There's no more chains holding me. And my soul is resting. And it's such a blessing to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. Freedom. And it sounds good. And it sounds nice. Got to be free. Greetings to all of you. My name is Private William Riley Salisbury, one of the 29th Connecticut Volunteers, and I fought in the Civil War. Now, that is the song that you heard me come in on with what our fight was all about, an opportunity and a chance at freedom. When I think back until the time of enlistment, I can still hear Sergeant Alexander Newton say, I enlist unto this conflict until the clanking of slave chains shall be heard no more. There's no more clanking. There's no more slave chains. Said, I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. Freedom. That it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. Now, before I begin to tell you our story, I always like to stop and give thanks and honor to all of those who have fought and died for our freedom. I think back unto the year 1828. There was a young slave by the name of Nat Turner who had desired to be free. All Nat ever wanted was one day to be free. So he had this vision. And in this vision said if slavery was going to be abolished, somebody had to die. And blood had to be shed. So Nat Turner gathered 59 men and one woman, and they tried to overthrow slavery in the South. But he was later captured, and he was hanged. Then in 1859, a white gentleman from Torrington, Connecticut, a Mr. John Brown, he took up the same vision that Nat had. And John Brown tried to overthrow slavery. And he was also captured, and he was hanged. Then in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and blacks everywhere were set free. And I say to you again, freedom said it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. Now, I was born in the year 1834. My mother's name was Eloisa Johnson and my dad I did not know. But I always wondered who dad was. Was dad a tall man? Was he strong or friendly or kind? But I never had an opportunity to meet him. But in 1840, my mother, she met and she married a Mr. Edwin Salisbury of Ellington, Connecticut. Now, Mr. Salisbury was a good man. He owned a nice piece of land. And he taught me all those things that a young man needed to know. He taught me respect and honor. But most of all, how to work with my hands. See, he was everything to me. He was my friend. He was my big brother. Thanks, Dad. But in 1855, I disappointed Dad. And I committed to crime. And I was sent to the Weathersfield State Prison where I spent four years of my life. That old song you just know everything about freedom, I just gave it off. But during that time, it was rumored that war was getting ready to start in our country. The North versus the South. 1861, war started. The North versus the South. Now, Blacks weren't allowed to fight that until 1862 when Congress passed an act allowing for the enlistment of colored soldiers. Then in 1863, the War Department established the Bureau of Colored Soldiers. Now, there was nearly 200,000 Black soldiers who fought during the Civil War. The problem the 60 artillery, infantry, engineer, and cavalry units. There's at least 100 Black officers. But you see, ma'am, I wasn't an officer, though. I was just a private. I was one of those little small guys, you see. But man, we served with this gentleman from Middletown, Sergeant Alfred Powers, who stood about six foot four, 245 pounds. 
See, Sergeant Patsworth was a big man. And we would all gather around our encampment and we would sing songs and play cards and drink our coffee and eat our heart attack. Then Sergeant Powers, he would quietly creep up on the scene and all the soldiers start going, this is so hard. This is so hard. See, seeing Sergeant Powers gave us that sense of hope that if a black man could be an officer in the United States Army at that time, and everything was possible with freedom. Anything you wanted to be, you could be with freedom. But it also rather the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass said to our men before we marched in the war. Frederick Douglass said, once let the black man get upon his person, the brass letters U.S., and an eagle on his button, and a musket on his shoulder, and bullets in his pocket, there is no power on earth that can deny that the black man has not earned the right to be a citizen in the United States. Freedom. Said it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. Now that was our goal. But now, as I think back, it's August of 1863. And it's real, real hot. Now my name is hot. Because the sweat was pouring in my face and pouring into my eyes, it was so hot. But I could hear the cries coming through the streets of Hartford. Nearly fifteen hundred soldiers enlisted. I enlisted on December twenty second of eighteen sixty three, but our regiment was not mustered into the United States Army not until March eighth of eighteen sixty four. Now, the reason for this delay was the Confederate Army had put out this huge threat saying if any white officer lead a group of colored soldiers, we're going to torture you. So no white officer wanted to lead our men. But all praise and thanks be to God, the Colonel William Wooster, who was formerly of the 20th. See, Colonel Wooster was brave, and he led our men into the war. But before going into this great war, something great happened to me. Guess what? Something awesome and fantastic happened to me. Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? I got married. I got married. I married my bride, Augusta E. Madison. And she was so attractive, and I, I had to marry her. But you see, I didn't get married on that great day alone, you see. Other soldiers married their sweethearts before going into this great battle. But now it's April 19th. We're down in New Haven, Connecticut. 29, fall in love. <laughs> we look like men marching on. We look like men at war. We look like men marching on. We look like men. Going to war. Oh, what a feeling to look like a man. Somebody who was thought of as nothing but property. But now we were standing on the streets of New Haven and we were looking like men. Hi, Mom, Cousin Elizabeth, Miss Augusta. Oh, it was our time to shine. It was our time to do our part in the Civil War. So we were off. We took this huge steamship, the Warrior, down to Annapolis, Maryland. But there in Maryland, we had to build fort and set up camp. So we began to dig and dig and dig and dig. But then one soldier said, I want this big boy to work. I want to be free. Said it sounds good and it sounds nice. To be free. But because we were US owned, we had to work and build fort and set up camp. So we did. After that, we were ordered to go down to Hilton Head, South Carolina. That's so they tell me through all of my time travel that Hilton Head has now become this great vacation place and people go and relax and enjoy life. But back then, war and battle was going on. Our first taste of battle came. Bermuda 100 
Virginia. They told us that Bermuda 100, Virginia, was the first place where the first 100 slaves had entered into our country. So we wanted to go down and set the captives free. And I remember that day. 29, four in line, sir, William Jonathan Joseph. And we were off, Bermuda, 100, Virginia. Remember moving through the woods and searching for the Confederate Army, but we didn't see the Confederate Army anywhere. But our orders was to just wait. But it seemed like the longer we waited, the quieter it got, but our orders was to just wait. And ma'am, you can hear the sounds of nature all around, but we were ordered to just wait. But then the officer told us to take our position and I could still hear him give the yell. <laughs> All oh, the rest of that day we fought and we did well. And the officer wrote back, said that those men of the 29th fought brave and gallantly. Black men who were thought of as nothing, fighting brave and gallantly. And I say to you once again, freedom, that it sounds good and it sounds nice, got to be free. After that battle, the next day, we held back a rebel's attack. Then we overtook Fort Harrison. Then we had to guard New Market Road, which is this very long and important territory. See, ma'am, in guarding New Market Road, if we were to lose ground, we were beginning to lose the Civil War. But if we were to gain ground and get closer and closer to Richmond, and we did well. After that, we were ordered to go down to Petersburg, the site of this huge, huge crater. But ma'am, let me tell you how the crater come to be. See, the crater is this big hole in the earth, you see. And what happened was the general who was in charge ordered the soldiers to dig this tunnel that was 500 yards long. But then he asked the man to dig another tunnel that's 75 feet long, but this time plant explosives in the tunnel. Now the soldiers being good men like we were, we all began to dig and dig. Can you guys help me out with a couple of digs? And oh, let's get aggressive and nice and loud and wait, wait. so we're digging in this tunnel, you see. And the Confederate and I began to wonder, what are all the Union soldiers up to? So all of their soldiers took formation and our soldiers are still digging inside the tunnel. That's it. And this big explosion and body parts are everywhere and the Confederate Army attacks. <laughs> 2,000 soldiers, black men and white men, in a matter of moments, over 2,000 soldiers. In a matter of seconds, over 2,000 soldiers. I stop now, and I honor all of those soldiers who have fought and died for our freedom. Over 2,000 soldiers. So every time I recall that battle, it hits me right here. And man, it always brings a tear to my eye because I lost two things in that battle, you see. All I wanted to do was to be free. I was going to sit up and die. They told me that freedom comes with a price. I didn't want to see my friends die. I don't know if you lost anybody close enough. But we couldn't stay there and cry. We, we, we had to gut it up. We, we, we had to gain courage. We had to become men. So we became 
Man, after that battle, we were ordered to go to the back so we could replenish and gather some more cartridges and to repair our worn and torn clothes. But during that time, Sergeant Alexander Newton, who had made that profound statement about enlisting until the clanking of slave chains was heard no more, he loved to eat chicken. Now, being a soldier that loved to eat chicken, he asked a number of us to go to this farm and gather up all these chickens. So, ma'am, you had all these tall soldiers chasing after these little tiny chickens. Yeah, because, see, they were serving you something called a hard tack. And I got a couple of pieces here and want you just to listen close and just imagine eating something that sounds like this. Oh, could you hear that? Could you imagine eating something that sounds like this is horrible and disgusting? And they wanted us to eat that. But I understood why he wanted the chicken. I understood why he wanted all those good vegetables, not knowing if the next battle was going to be his last. It's late October now, and the weather's starting to change. And it's starting to get cold. And I knew it was getting cold because the musket that I was holding, it was starting to get cold. And all of the wool that you see me wearing wasn't keeping me warm anymore. But our orders was to go down and fight at Kell House. The Kell House was this huge landmark where we were ordered to fight at. And I can hear the officer give the command. For two days, we fought and battled at Kell House. Then we lost nearly 80 soldiers from Hartford and New Haven and Bridgeport and surrounding towns. 80 soldiers who have fought and died for our freedom. And I say to you once again, freedom said it sounds good and it sounds nice. Got to be free. After that battle, we were finally recognized. And we were placed with the 5th Brigade and had to guard New Market Road, which was that very long and important territory. But then on March 9th of 1865, I, Private William Riley Salisbury Webb, sustained an eye injury. And I began to go blind in my left eye. So I was discharged and sent back home to 257 Front Street, where I lived in Hartford. But because I was discharged, sir, it didn't mean that the war stopped nor did the 29th quit. But it was said on April 7th, at the close of the Civil War, the 29th Connecticut Volunteers was one of the first regiments to reach Richmond at that time. Those same soldiers were ordered to go to Texas where they guarded over 20,000 soldiers. Then they got the call to report home. 29th, on November 25th, of 1865, the 29th Connecticut Volunteers was paid and went home. Said I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. There's no more chains holding me. Oh, oh, oh. oh, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Oh. If you say it with me, freedom. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds nice. Got to be free. Come on, one more time. Sounds good. Sounds nice. Got to be free. Thank you. Come on, give yourselves a big hand. Come on, thank you all. I appreciate it. My name is Kevin Johnson. I'm an employee of the Connecticut State Library History and Genealogy Unit. And what you have just witnessed is the 690th time that I've shared that story of Private William Webb. I hope I did okay. Did I do all right with the story? Oh, uh, it takes a whole lot out of me, but I would have never imagined, sir, doing anything 690 times. And so how I got started briefly as we talk about this before opening up for some questions 
uh, how I got started talking about private web. Uh, one day, our museum director, who is now retired, uh, Mr. Dean Nelson, came over to me one day and he says, hey, Kev, how would you like to become Denzel Washington for a moment? And I said, sure. And so what happened was they wanted us to do something to honor the Black soldiers for the Freedom Trail. You ever heard of the Freedom Trail, Freedom Trail? So we were asked to participate. So Dean asked me to become Denzel. And I said, yeah. And so we marched down to the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Bushnell Park. And I'm standing there at the Sailors Monument and taking a series of photographs. And this young man comes over and he sees me dressed in a Civil War outfit. And he says, man, you're one of the Buffalo Soldiers. And I told him, no, sir, not one of the Buffalo Soldiers. Now, the Buffalo Soldiers were those Black soldiers that stayed in the Army after the Civil War. They went out west and down to Texas and made a great name for themselves. But I told him, no, sir, not one of the Buffalo soldiers. But ma'am, he looks at me real close. He says, are you sure you're not Denzel Washington? I said, no, no, not Denzel Washington. As you know, Denzel starred in the movie Glory with the 54th Mass, and they had that great battle at Fort Wagner and made a great name for themselves. But told him, no, sir, not from the 54th. We started talking about our great state of Connecticut. State of Connecticut enlisted two black regiments, the 29th and the 30th. The 30th didn't raise enough soldiers, so those guys who they did recruit, they placed those soldiers with the 31st unit, United States 31st Colored Regiment, and they went right into action. So our guys were still being recruited and trained and prepared to go into battle. So this young man says, hey, Kev, uh, you sound like you know a lot about the 29th story. How about coming over to the University of Connecticut, talking to a classroom about the 29th story? And I'm thinking about it and I'm saying, oh, this is a great opportunity as an African-American to talk about African-American history and to share the Civil War. And as I'm agreeing to do this, my museum director is behind me going, Kev, don't do it, man, don't do it, don't do it. And he tells me why. He said, because once you take one Civil War program, you will never stop telling the story. How many times have I told the story? I think DU was absolutely correct. Uh, 690 times. That date was February 10th of 1998. Had absolutely no idea that here it is now some 24 or almost 20, 24 years later that I'm still sharing this particular story. Had no idea. This story has taken me into a number of schools and libraries, historical societies, uh, churches, uh, into uh, correctional facilities. Uh, even had the great opportunity of presenting in Manhattan, had a chance to stand on the great stage in Tanglewood. Anyone heard of Tanglewood? Had a chance to stand on the great stage of Tanglewood and share and salute to America with all these actors and everyone else. And here am I coming out, uh, sharing the story of Private Web. This story has truly changed and made an impact in my life. Would have never uh, imagined being able to do and to meet so many different people from sharing this historical character. A private web. Private web was an actual person, uh, was one who lived in Hartford. And what we wanted to do, and I say we because it was a collective effort uh, from our museum and our HG history and genealogy staff. And before I forget, let me do this quick PR moment. The Connecticut State Library is this great place uh, we're located, 231 Capitol Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut, right across from your state capital. If you haven't come and visit us, please come. I, I did my PR moment, all right? And so as we share now uh, with that particular piece of private web and diving into that history, I uh, wanted to really tell the story of someone from Hartford. Uh, finger rolled down the enlistment papers, stopped on private web, had no idea who he was, but had to actually dive into uh, the, the history books and into our primary sources to begin to pull out his information. And what you see and hear or heard is a part of all that information that we were able to dig in and to find out about private web. But I can talk about this for a great deal. I know it's a Thursday night, but any thoughts while I was sharing the story of private web that questions may have flooded your mind that you may be curious about private web? Any thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Uh, just in doing the vital record search, uh, what we had to do was found his enlistment papers and began to start working back. Uh, backwards, as you know, when you do family history, has anyone ever come to the Connecticut State Library? I got to go now. If it's the York Connecticut State, oh, please. You got to come to stop. 
<laughs> and so what we did, man, was go through the state archives and uh, through our land and vital records and began to do a, a family genealogy search. Uh, remember Alex Haley did the movie Roots? And so we began to start working backwards. I found his mom uh, in the 1840 census and her marriage to Mr. Salisbury, found Private Webb, not sure where the last name Webb comes from. Uh, we believe it might have been out of wedlock. His mother was a slave, but Private Webb was not. Uh, so not sure where the Webb uh, last surname has come from, uh, but it is there. And then when she marries uh, Mr. Salisbury, he takes on his, his stepdad's uh, name and began to do that. Did have a sister. Uh, did have a sister. She actually marries and relocates into the Boston area and to a prominent family there. But I haven't begun to do all the research because I'm on the road presenting 690 times. <laughs> so, but that's how we got started digging into the history. Yes, ma'am. Ah, Private Webb went into the war uh, at the age of 29 uh, after going through prison. Uh, and I'll get to that piece there uh, momentarily and going through prison. And then he uh, discharged. He dies at the age of 34. So he goes into prison. Uh, he's uh, enlisted in 29, dies at the age of 34, comes back home to uh, Front Street, which is near, I don't know if anyone will know Hartford, but the convention center with a new convention center, science museum, that whole area where many African-Americans actually lived. So when he came home from the war, we found him on a street in Front Street there in a house with a couple of other soldiers. Uh, at that time, Fitch's home was not accepting African-Americans. And so he was in this house. We believe it might have been a home where uh, wounded soldiers or soldiers were going. Uh, couldn't fully identify this home, but you had about five or six soldiers that actually lived there. He worked as a laborer uh, for a year, and then he dies, uh, 1868. Uh, have no clue where he's buried. So my search is still after where he's buried. He did have a will, uh, was left with, died pretty much as a poor person, a pauper. Uh, has a house in Ellington with which is families and left with twenty five dollars. Uh, so I'm still in search of finding out where he's buried. Uh, at this point, we believe he's buried in an unmarked grave. So one of the things that I'm actually after, if we can locate that, then what I want to do is actually raise a headstone uh, to leave the marker for this gentleman whose life has been a part of my life for now some twenty plus years. And so I definitely want to do that. Great question, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, All right, let me tell you about my wife. Okay. As we go through the records now, and I'm looking for Private Webb, and I, I, I spot him, we find him, and kind of lose track of him in the 1850 census. Uh, he's nowhere around. Realized that he was actually uh, in prison. Uh, was going with through a, a stole a boat and some clothes from one of the stores that he and a buddy of his was caught on the Connecticut River. And as he was caught on the Connecticut River, he was given two years sentenced in the Thailand prison. But Private Webb did not want to stay in the Thailand prison. So what does he do? He breaks out. And so as he escapes from the prison, he's recaptured and given two more years where uh, he spends those years at the Wethersfield State Prison, which you all know now is the Department of Motor Vehicle in Wethersfield, Connecticut. Oh, I forgot. We were, we were recording. Oh, man. <laughs> and so that's what that is. Uh, but as I've gone through those records, uh, his wife, I found that he got married uh, to Augusta. And when I'm looking at the, the, the vital records, I see the marriage, and he is 29 years old. But at the, t the record at the time says Augusta is only 11. Okay, I'll leave on that one. Yeah, Augusta's 11. And my thought, could you imagine me when I'm sharing with our school-age kids and I share that piece, and they're going... <laughs> making all faces I'm the same way. And I'm realizing, wow, that's very young. But then I tell them, as I'm sharing with you, in his discharge paper, she was not 11 years old. She was actually 14 years old. A lot better. Uh, but as I thought about that, and we know there's a period between 1860 and 1868 that we call the marrying season. So you find many young ladies, uh, African-American, Native American, Europeans, that are actually getting married at this young age. So when you began to do your own personal family history, don't be surprised that great, great, great grandma may have gotten married at age 15 or 16. Uh, it wasn't something that was uncommon, had to have permission. And so Augusta marries Private Webb at the age of 14, 
but she later dies at the age of 19. Uh, no children. She dies of consumption, uh, which is like our tuberculosis. So she dies very young. Uh, still not sure where she's buried. So my quest is to find where the two of them, if I can find her, I'll probably most likely find him uh, buried next to each other. But great question. Uh, no kids to the union. Um, and pretty much his line pretty much ends as far as the records have shown. Uh, if I began to do the research to his sister's side, then I'll be able to find some family members, some descendants uh, down through the years. Great question. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Private Webb, he was sick. Uh, he had uh, an illness, disease, pneumonia. Uh, also, his wound, he had received some powder into his eye, began to deteriorate the retina, so it started to go blind from there. Uh, but pneumonia uh, was one. I was just looking at a record today, too, uh, where they thought he had, was a deserter. Uh, and then we have these great records at the State Library. You, you guys got to got to come. You got to come. But they have these great records. We have these great records and uh, thought he was a deserter. So as they are traveling along uh, the South, they're doing these muster rolling, these check-ins, and he's missing a couple of times. Uh, but he actually was sick uh, in the hospital. And so he dies of an illness, uh, pneumonia, from what we understand to be uh, his illness. And he dies in 1868. Great question. Any other thoughts or questions? Uh, let me share one of the great things that and digging through the history that I found to be so fascinating for myself, not knowing anything about the 29th or private web, very limited. Uh, when I was asked to go and share the story, I needed to go and cram. I needed to go and dive into our records and pull the story out. One of the fascinating things, this story has been here and on record since the Civil War and prior. Uh, but what we need is more researchers going in and pulling out these great stories. So when you began to dive into your own family history, began to look at the part that your family played. Uh, there are so many roles in, in, of, of our great history that we haven't even explored yet and so many stories that we don't know. So I talked to many historians like, a great deal uh, and sharing with them that it's hard to say that you're an expert in this because there's too many stories that we just don't know. There's too many people that we just don't know. And so Private Web story is one of those stories that's caught up. So diving into those state archives have some great military records where you're able to pull out uh, the, the vital records, what we just did, as went through the 1,600 names of soldiers from the 29th and 30th. So if you get a chance, look at our website, and you can begin to look up soldiers from the 29th. We actually did an index uh, about these soldiers and a quick bio on there from their enlistment papers. That was a great project, gave me a chance to handle 1,600 uh, enlistment papers of these soldiers and to be able to record their information. And so that just was a fascinating project. But looking at some of the other stuff uh, that really gripped me was some of Colonel Wooster records and the Connecticut War record, which trailed all of our Connecticut regiments. <coughs> Connecticut had 30 regiments that they enlisted into the war. As I said, two of those were African-American but they would actually follow uh, each regiment and they would give a report on who was killed or who was promoted or what battles they were in. And when they talked about the 29th and some of the soldiers from the 30th thought that they were good men uh, and men that were uh, educated, uh, men uh, who were able to, to become good soldiers. And so I thought that was very interesting that the editor actually writes this uh, about the soldiers in this particular period. And so even Colonel Wooster uh, leave some good documents about the 29th and their story. And so uh, it's, it's a fascinating piece. Some of the things that wows me uh, over the history is looking at this journey of freedom. Uh, when you began looking at many of the documents, so all these gentlemen wanted was to be free uh, and fighting was going to help them do that. And Frederick Douglass was a true advocate. He was one that was really pressing uh, Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln to really allow blacks to fight. And when that did happen, it gave us the manpower uh, to be able to overcome and win the Civil War. Yes, ma'am. Great question. Great question. Uh, as we know, when we think about the Revolutionary War, uh, it's integrated. Uh, have a lot of integration there. But comes to the Civil War, uh, no, it's, it's segregated. Uh, the 29th is all Black. Uh, but then you have some spots, uh, soldiers who may be mulattoes, 
uh, that are fitting in within some of the white regiments. Uh, you'll find in the beginning of the war uh, that you had uh, some, uh, they have complexion on the enlistment paper and they would say dark. Uh, <laughs> complexion was dark, which meant at that time, which is uh, uh, something that we are really uncertain of because if you're out in the sun, you get dark. And so that, that's something that we, we're not sure if they had blacks that were in those regiments because they looked at the complexion. Um, some were mulattoes that were there that we are aware of. And so those are some things where you may have one or two soldiers that are actually African-American that are serving uh, with white regiments. And then we know that, oh, yes, ma'am. Can I have a sip of that water? It's equal pay. Oh, no, that was a, a huge issue. Uh, that was a huge issue uh, going into the, oh, thank you, Ms. Bank. Let me just take a quick sip. Already got some good water. That's some good water. Uh, and so uh, as, uh, as uh, we think about with the equal pay, that was a, a huge challenge. Um, knowing that you're going into the battle, you promise to get the bounty of uh, $100, $300 going in. Also, you're looking at getting uh, $16, uh, 13 received, paying for your uniform. But African-American soldiers, it was cut down. And so they were only receiving $7. And so that was a big issue, as we saw when we looked at the movie Glory. Uh, we, remember the movie Glory and that whole scene where they refused to get paid uh, because they wanted equal pay. And later it became um, retroactive towards the end of the war where they did receive uh, extra money during that period. But that was a battle and, a, uh, and a, a hard part of the war there. But what the dilemma was, reading from one of our soldiers, I believe from the 55th Regiment, and writing about equal pay, it wasn't about necessarily the money. It was the hope that if we can serve and fight and prove to be men, then we deserve this equality. So the hope of freedom is there. And the military was going to show the country that Blacks are, are worthy of this. So it wasn't about just so much the money as it was the hope of freedom. I thought that was very interesting from this soldier to actually write that piece uh, because it wasn't about the money. It was more so about the hope of freedom. I mean, one of the, the, the taglines for me, as you heard me share, is the freedom. It sounds good. Sounds nice. Got to be free. That was the calling card. Uh, that was what was pulling them. When we think of our country's history, we look at the Revolutionary War. It's a turbulent time. I actually talk about uh, Jordan Freeman, who was killed at the Battle of Fort Griswold. Anyone remember Jordan Freeman from Fort Griswold? Okay, I share his story uh, and character, but in there is one of your gentlemen from here, uh, Ned, who served or fought that was killed at the home of Major Daniel Stark. Uh, and the hope of freedom uh, was there stemming from the Revolutionary War. So my tagline has always been, and from reading those documents, is this quest of freedom. Uh, there are many times that they were fighting, uh, not for their own, necessarily their freedom, but for the generations to come. So that spirit of freedom uh, was there hoping that the descendants will get a chance to experience what we may not have been able to experience. And so some of them died uh, without being free. Some of them died hoping for the thing of freedom. And so that spirit, even for my own family history, uh, my family is a Southern family. And my great, great, great grandfather was sold in Virginia, uh, purchased by the Browns and taken to Alabama where he's in Alabama, but then he's uh, a Brown family finds him, brings him back to Virginia, uh, or excuse me, back to Alabama. He goes from Virginia to Alabama, and my family actually winds up in Alabama. Grandfather owns one of the big farms that was there in that little small area, 99-acre uh, farm at the time, and I actually had to work this land, so my hands are chapped uh, from doing that, but uh, those that hope and spirit is passed on into the next generation. Contemporary-wise, it's still something that we're fighting for, uh, still fighting for the equality. Uh, and, and I always use the term, not necessarily equality for me, more so than freedom. Uh, there's the difference because people, if, when you think about, as I'm sharing this with students, you think about brothers and sisters in the house. Uh, as parents, 
you know, we know the needs of our children. And so even in our own homes, our kids are, as much as we love them, but there's a certain need that you may gear to the other kid, you know, because of what the child may need. We know as dads, my dad told me, sir, uh, I wasn't good with my hands. So what he would share with me is say, go read a book. Where do I work? So my dad knew something. Of, I work in a library, you know? And so he would say, go read a book. And so that spirit uh, is what you really, is what still is what pulling us now. When you see even some of the things going on in today's society, it's stemming from that spirit that things still aren't where they need to be because it's more so about the freedom. And if we can ever get there as a nation and deal with some of these issues, uh, the Civil War is one of the great ways to be able to talk about race, uh, to talk about the elephant in the room, uh, because we can all agree that slavery was wrong. Can I? So we can all agree that. And so as we agree upon that now, how, where do we go from here? Uh, and freedom is the only avenue of giving each person uh, their right to do. And we are not going to like the same things. Uh, but we just want the freedom to be able to go without any hindrances. I hope that helped you uh, there. And, and, that, and that spirit is in me. My grandparents made it come get in me. So I, I, I yeah, there, there are some letters from some of the soldiers. There's actually three books about the 29th, uh, the Out of the Briar story by Alexander Newton, uh, which is the piece that I share uh, about the chickens. Uh, that's a regimental thing. So I share that piece. One of the things I try to do there, too, is to lighten it up a little bit. Uh, when you're dealing with school kids to lighten it up so they can begin to receive more. And so some of those letters that we're able to actually share, uh, Private Webb didn't leave any letters behind, but he did leave a paper trail. Uh, what I mean by a paper trail is from his prison records. Um, that it's, it's information. So when you begin looking at your family history, uh, please use the court documents. Court documents give you so much great information about our ancestors because we're suing uh, or being sued. Uh, and so there's, uh, you're buying land. Uh, so uh, always use court documents. It gives you great information about your ancestor. Uh, and so that's one. So we do have some letters there, but from the officers to writing. Um, uh, Alfred Powers, uh, the six foot four gentleman uh, who later comes home. He lives in Middletown. He works as a chef in Middletown. Uh, he's trying, his wife, he dies in 1907. He's six foot four, 445 pounds. Uh, he's a big guy when he passes, but decorated. He's part of the Grand Army of the Republic. So he's a GAR member. He's very active still after the war. His wife actually writes for his pension uh, and receives a pension. So we do have some of those letters. So thank you, sir, for sharing that. Uh, when you come to our library, we do have different regimental pieces where uh, researchers have put together and compiled some of the letters, have a number of record groups where we got letters uh, that are there. And so we definitely could add to the story. So thank you, because it's giving you the, in, the, in the field, uh, what's going on in the field and what's going on around those guys uh, in the midst of this uh, huge war. Uh, and, and remember, they're young guys, you know, not, not soldiers you know, being recruited into this, this huge conflict. And so it's horror uh, to some of the stuff that they're seeing and they're writing back home, uh, sharing that experience. So it's, that's a great thing. Heart Attack and Coffee, I always try to read. Anyone ever read Heart Attack and Coffee? It's a great military book. I just like to read the opening pages of it. Uh, and I, I read it a little bit of it today, uh, every time I have to present, because it sets the stage for me. When I think about the, the Civil War, uh, this gentleman who's writing, and he's in New Hampshire on vacation. And as he's on vacation, he goes out for dinner, back to letters. And he's sitting there, and he's talking to someone about his uh, time in the Army, in the Civil War, not realizing the, 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 the historic impact. So the next night, he goes back out to dinner, and now he has 10 people that's listening to him. Comes back out the next night. And now it's a crowd, and they just are so interested in the stories, in the letters, and what it was like being in this historic battle. And so when I always read Heart Attack and Coffee, it gives me chills because every time I get ready to present, I think about this space 
and how important this was for the country as much as we've lost over 620,000 lives. That's a lot of loss. But it was something that, as I share and I do my Nat Turner piece, uh, that the only way slavery was going to be abolished was going to be through bloodshed. Sad that I had to come to that. But we lost so many Americans uh, over that. So thank you, sir, for sharing. Yes, ma'am. Don't want to forget your question. Still, still the same codes uh, because of complexion. So still the same things that are there. Our, our state, you know, we abolished slavery in 1848. And so what we became more, um, as I heard a gentleman uh, kind of share uh, that it's a society that's um, not a slave culture, uh, but a society that's living with slaves. So we became more kind of looked the other way. Um, if you couldn't mistreat, we had laws on our books that you couldn't abuse or mistreat uh, your servant. Uh, even if they were set free, there was still some way that you may have had to take care of them if they did something. So it was some hindrances, the, the cold. Uh, if, if you lived in certain areas, 1800 um, or later, you're, you're free, but now you can't live in a certain town. Uh, so these restrictions are there. Uh, so it's still blocking your pathway. So yet you, you are a free person, but yet they are the roadblocks. Yeah, the, but the same kind, I mean, remember we, we have more factories, you know, we have more, it's more agricultural in the South. And so here, you know, you still got the same blocks uh, that are there. Uh, we, we're just nice, we try to be nice about it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so there's no way of really being nice about you know, putting roadblocks uh, in front of people. And so you, we were still doing that piece. And I mean, I mean definitely when we think about our, our state, uh, there were opportunities to grow, um, but it just was going to, it's still going to be work. You know, uh, you think about um, many of the African-American churches, uh, abolitionist movement is coming strong, pushing for the Civil War. Reconstruction is a period now that I'm really looking at now, because when you think about the aftermath of the Civil War, um, where did we go? You know, how, how did it change? Um, you got the South who lost the war, but yet need to be uh, back into the country. And so Reconstruction is a pivotal period. So when we look at Reconstruction, we can begin to see some of our flaws where we actually dropped the ball in some areas there. So that's one of those areas I'm looking at, a uh, really hard uh, piece there uh, for this thing of freedom. Uh, any other questions or thoughts? Got to share this with you real quick, the uniform, uh, and then we'll close. Then we'll close the uniform. As I think about the uniform, I had to go to that school. I had to go to UConn and share. Uh, I'm thinking, boy, I can go in, put a nice shirt and tie on, and stand behind the desk in the podium and give a great lecture. But I said, but well, students hear that all day. So I was, I'm, I'm agreeing to this, and I'm thinking, let me get a Civil War uniform. And if I go in, sing that old Negro spiritual that you heard me, which my family made me learn that song as a youth. And so that song is twofold. Freedom was going to come by liberation or it's going to come by death. Uh, when you arrived in heaven, you were going to be free at some point. So that song is so fitting for me and it brings my family with me. So every time I present, my mother would say, did I sing that song okay? My mother would say, don't, don't sing, don't sing, don't sing. And so... So I always sing that song because it reminds me uh, of just my own family history. Uh, but in sharing it, I thought, well, boy, I can put on a Civil War uniform. So I needed to get a uniform, went back to the museum, and we're looking through the museum and I'm looking at blouses, you know, to wear. And we take one off the rack, sir, and uh, put my left arm in. And I, I'm, I'm five, ten and a half at the time. I'm, I'm shrinking. I'm five, ten and a half. I'm 210 pounds. And I go to put the other side in, and I'm going, this is not going to work. <laughs> so I better take it off because y'all will be reading about me for destroying state property. So I had to hang that up. So we had to get a uniform. And I'll share with the uniform very quickly. 29th was part of the Union Army, was issued the dark navy blue blouse and the light wool trousers. As you can see, the uniform came in two sizes. It either fit or it didn't. <laughs> so soldiers had to swap to find one that was more suited for them. Uh, Private Webb was 5'5". Five, five. He was a small gentleman. And so I needed to just try to make sure I could get a comfortable uniform to wear. The shirt that I'm wearing is a wool blended shirt. 
And so you see I'm sweating. Uh, there are some days where I'm just dripping wet, depending on the, the room or the temperature. Uh, it's this hot, all wool, uh, one uniform all year round. Uh, there's no summer uniform. There's no, no stylish uniform, one uniform all year round, which is all wool. Uh, you all know what this is, right? Canteen. Got to tell you the story of the canteen. Canteen is used for drinking water, but some of the officers, sir, will have some of the special drinks inside their canteen. Won't get into those details. Uh, but the canteen also becomes a deadly weapon. Uh, why? Uh, when you think about the soldiers, uh, is there a piece of a body of water that's nearby? What is it called? The Saugatuck River? Would, would you drink water out of there, ma'am? <laughs> that, you don't know no more. You don't have to say anymore. But let's use the Saugatuck River. So down south. Anyone ever gone to Virginia? Summertime. Temperature is about what? Hot. 110 in the shade. So our guys is along the line there. Just imagine. You got a thousand guys in the Civil War Regiment. Here we go to the Saugatuck River. Guys are left the battle. They're bleeding. They're disgusting. Uh, they head to the river. And one soldier... Uh, they move on. Here come another group, a thousand men, head to the Saugatuck River. Guys washed off blood and everything else into the river. Uh, and here a soldier takes his canteen, dips that bad boy in that river, heads back out into the field. Remember, we're down south. We're in South Carolina, border of Georgia, uh, back out in the field. I'm wearing what? Whoa, 110 in the shade. What do you think that soldier's going to do? Take a sip of that water. What do you think is happening to him? Sick, dysentery, some other disease may set in. Disease, as we think about the Civil War, is one of the number one killers. Uh, we think about all of the battles, but disease is one of the number one killers of Civil War soldiers. I always like to say canteen, if you don't have a chance to purify your water. So when we hear those purify, you know, clean water uh, makes a great deal. And so a canteen is such a useful tool, but can also become a very deadly weapon. Haversack, uh, soldier's personal bag. Uh, inside the haversack was the food bag. They would have uh, that heart attack. Oh, oh yeah, let me. Eight o'clock. Did you eat yet? <laughs> oh, you don't want it here. <laughs> heart attack. Heart attack. Uh, it's made of flour. I may want to write this down. <laughs> flour, water, and a pinch of salt. Uh, cooked on about 350, 75 degrees. Take it out of the oven, sit it on your, 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 your deck, uh, bring it back in for two days, uh, and then sit it back out there. Heart attack uh, reminds me of premium saltines. And so I would always share with the students many times uh, when we have fifth graders or high school, we'll say, what if your teacher gave you a, a premium saltine and you put it in your knapsack and you got to 12th grade? What do you think happened to it? What do you think happens over time? Mold. Uh, what else? Dry. Yeah. What are those bugs that come out of stuff? Got the, the maggots, weevils to come out. <laughs> so just imagine you got a soldier in the field. He's got salt pork, goober beans, other goodies inside his bag, heart attack. He reaches into that bag, pulls that out. He sees some, some maggots on there. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to brush that bad boy off, find us a hot cup of coffee, and he's going to have us a heart attack. Heart attack actually lasted to, I believe, World War I. So the piece that I'm holding here is probably, we had COVID. Uh, yeah, so this is probably maybe four years. W would you like a piece of <laughs> And so heart attack is one of those things. So I got a couple of pieces. So before you leave, please uh, take those. Uh, they would have that inside their, their, their haversack. You would find many families have these actually in attics. Uh, when we look at curators and finding great artifacts, this is one that wouldn't be uh, of high value because so many families would have them. But it's a great Civil War piece. Uh, the last bag, oh, the shoes. Um, if you can see my shoes. This is my, actually my second pair of shoes over the 20 years. I actually wore out the other shoes. Um, Dean, my museum guy, actually made the shoes. And the shoes took him 52 hours to make. 
And so it's a nice hard leather. One of the things about our guys was we were the infantry. So we walked once we got to the battles. So when you look at Civil War soldiers, uh, our insignia, that light blue represented infantry. 29 was our regimental member. And so you would find us in the field. So you need to have good shoes. Connecticut didn't have a lot of the issues that many of the uh, uh, early African-American regiments had. You did have the first South Carolina who didn't really participate in many battles. And then, you know, the 54th was the first Northern African-American regiment to actually get into the Civil War. And then others started following after that. We didn't have the same issues as Buckingham when he was ready for, for African-Americans to get into the war. Uh, we had a lot of great, uh, we were more prepared than some of those others. The knapsack. Inside a soldier's knapsack was issued two wool blankets. One soldier would carry the tent. Uh, they did the buddy system. Another soldier would carry the other half of the tent. They had letters, uh, Bibles, utensils, anything that was dear to them, they would actually keep inside this knapsack. We had a gentleman from the 16th Connecticut that actually, in our museum, that actually weighed every item and it totaled to be 52 pounds. Oh, you, you had to go into battle, every battle, in and, and your gear. And so you would have, sometimes leaving these to the side, you would find these, as we read the accounts, left to the side, you go into battle with your, uh, pretty much this, yeah, pretty much full gear going into battle. Uh, but could you imagine 52 pounds on your back? Then you got guys firing at you. Uh, Civil War was very brutal war uh, that these men, and then some women who disguised themselves as men, uh, fighting into the Civil War. Uh, how did they discover them was when they were injured. And so that she's injured. The soldier's injured. Go into the medic. And as the medic is beginning to look at the examine and go, <laughs> or after the war, uh, some of the ladies were actually trying to get pensions and describe that they were uh, soldier, such and such. Uh, so you did have women that were disguised themselves as served as men uh, during that particular period. But any other last minute questions? So pension records is great and also leads for our for the children uh, to how many kids. And so those, those are some great documents. But please get a chance to visit the state library. I left some information about our agency. There's a nice word search. Um, so when you all are having coffee tonight or in the morning, uh, some, some sources here, and also that word search of some of the words and terms that I use uh, into the story. Uh, this here is a great piece uh, for families. Uh, it's projects that we give to kids uh, to be able to interview your grandparents. Uh, and I think it leaves a great account. It's a starting geneo genealogical chart, uh, began working backwards. I like the oral stories. I like the lessons. Uh, that we can learn. Uh, sometimes you won't be able to find some of these in the book. And I think about our seniors many times is you don't want to go off the scene and not pass this information forward. Uh, when my grandmother died at 96, uh, I sat with her. So I've learned a great deal of my own family history from just talking to my grandmother. Uh, as a junior in high school, I, I just fell in love with history, but not necessarily what was on record, but the person. Uh, my next character that I'm working on now is Professor Jim. Professor Jim was a janitor for Trinity College for 50 years, and he has a fascinating story. And what I love with his story, sir, is I don't have to remember dates and none of those because I'm 90 years old. <laughs> and so, but that is my give back to our seniors uh, because when you think about Professor Jim's story, uh, we think of him, and you may think of him as just as a lowly janitor, but this gentleman impacted the students of Trinity. They actually named the wing after him uh, of his impact that he has made upon the, the university. Um, and here he is just a janitor, but it lets us know that we're more than what the, the shell is or our title. Uh, there's so much more to us. Uh, when we look at one another, let's see underneath. And when I tell Professor Jim's story, and hopefully I'll be ready to go in January, because uh, I got to stop sharing the Civil War story. Uh, but when I share that story, it'll give me a chance to really um, share with our seniors. 
and to pull our seniors uh, from the back to the front because our seniors have seen so much history. And it may not be in a book, but this allows you to share it with your kids. And then they carry that history along with them and it'll never be forgotten. Thank you all for allowing me to come and share. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.